Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater, home of public programs for the UCLA Film and Television Archive. I'm Mark Quigley. I'm the John H. Mitchell Television Curator for the Archive. Thank you for joining us tonight for the 60th anniversary celebration of the landmark series, The Outer Limits. Before we begin, as a land-grant institution, the Film and Television Archive at UCLA would like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino and Tongva peoples. We are humbled to do work in this community. We also need to take a moment to thank the entities who helped make tonight's screening possible. All of the archive screenings in the Wilder are free, thanks to a gift from an anonymous donor. And we're grateful for their support and to the Hammer Museum for their partnership. This screening has also been made possible by the John H. Mitchell Television Programming Endowment. So let's please give these critical supporters another round of applause. It's why you didn't have to pay to get in tonight. Now, travel back in time to September 16th, 1963, 7.30 p.m. You've turned your TV dial to ABC for the premiere of a new series. But there's something wrong with your television set. <laughs> You no longer control the horizontal. You can no longer control the volume. For the duration of the TV season, your 19-inch black and white Zenith set belongs to the creative genius of series masterminds Leslie Stevens and Joseph Stefano. <laughs> to explain this phenomenon following our screening, we will have a panel discussion with three experts. Joanne Morelli. Associate Professor in Media, Study, Media and Screen Studies at Northwestern University, Northeastern University, and author of the excellent, recently published and sold out in the lobby, TV Milestone's book, The Outer Limits. David J. Scow, historian and screenwriter, and author of the extens extensive and essential works, The Outer Limits Companion and The Outer Limits at 50. Mark David Aham. And Mark Scott Zickry, historian and screenwriter and author of one of the most important books of my childhood, the groundbreaking and essential Twilight Zone Companion. Please give them all a big hand. Now, we were expecting some special guests tonight, and I'm not sure if they made it, but we were hoping that Leslie Stevens' daughters and Joseph Stefano's son and wife were here. Did they make it, David? So thank you, um, Samantha Stevens, Sunday Stevens, Marilyn Stefano, and Dominic Stefano. We're honored to have you here with us. The Outer Limits series is now available on DVD in pristine quality. Tonight, we've elected instead to utilize 100-year-old projection technology <laughs> to share gloriously imperfect celluloid prints that are 60 years old. First up is The Galaxy Bing, the original pilot for The Outer Limits, but you won't see the iconic series title anywhere on the 35 millimeter ABC network print we are screening, a point we'll be sure to examine in our Q&A. The masterful pilot will be followed by a 16 millimeter print of another one of the best episodes of the series, The Bolero Shield, and that print features original commercials. So for the next two hours, Turn off your phones, sit quietly, as giants Leslie Stevens and Joseph Stefano control all that you see and hear. You are about to experience the awe and mystery of one of the most unique series ever broadcast. Enjoy and stick around for the Q&A. But there was a lot of cross-fertilization in terms of actors, obviously. Uh, John Hoyt, who played the alien in that second episode in the Bolero Shield, he, uh, he was on a couple of Twilight Zone episodes. He was the first doctor on Star Trek, on the first pilot. So, uh, you know, so there's, there's a lot of cross-fertilization. And the writers, of course, with Matheson and, and Jerry Soule. And, and John Harlan. Herman cast both shows. Yes, he did, and he was quite, quite a guy. So, um, but, but this was... But what Rod set in motion was the writer running the show creatively and and definitely Leslie Stevens and uh, Joe Stefano you know, took took that and ran with it there's a great authorial voice uh, on both shows these are writers shows more than anything else and uh, and the writers are running productions so it's their say of what gets made it's th these are extremely um, individualistic 
uh, products from in a, in a mass medium, but they're, gr they're great. Oh, I was going to say, and, and they got that because all of them were writers during television's golden age. Yeah. They were all writers for Playhouse 90, which was the prestige television of the time. But during that period, the the it was all about the writer, you mm. know. And so they they uh, are the, some of the few people who carried that over to television. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you agree, Joanne, that the uh, uh, the uh, Please Stand By, the Galaxy being, is like Leslie Stevens' shiny, optimistic, technological <laughs> view of the story, <laughs> and the Velro Shield is Joe's dark, gothic. <laughs> oh, definitely. Oh, no. That's fun. I know. And the I have a trivia question for Mark. Show you that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, she for Mark, I have a trivia question. Sure. Did you, the Galaxy being, when he's walking down the street, That's great. did you recognize the store? No. What's the store? Tell me. They shot the Galaxy Being before they got their studio facilities. Oh. They shot the Galaxy Being at MGM. Yeah, yeah. When it was shut familiar. down for Cleopatra. That's great. He walks past a store with a window that says Babcocks. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know what <laughs> Twilight Zone episode that window appears in? Mark? I don't know. And when Printer's open, Devil. Printer's Devil. That's great. There. That's great. But but the cool part about about uh, that first <laughs> episode is the fact that, I, as I, I'm sure many of you knew, uh, that was a negative image with a, <clears throat> a black alien with oil on it to give it that yeah. shine. And that's what makes it look so remarkably uh, original and creepy and strange. And this is where they're using what are called practical effects in many cases on, cam you know, tr tricking the camera, doing a lot of stuff in the lab. This is the very early days of, of VFX that we would talk about today, but there, there was an enormous ingenuity at, at, at play to, to deliver that because the aliens in Outer Limits are, are spectacular. You know? uh, let's, let, me, uh, let me interject there for a second because yeah. I, I want to uh, rewind a little bit since we're talking about the galaxy being and setting it up with like Twilight Zone kind of sunsetting. Um, and so Joanne, we're, Twilight Zone is definitely not optimistic when it comes to technology and anxieties around the space race, but I think Outer Limits, how would you define Outer Limits, the t their take on technology? I think that they see technology as, I mean, I, there are, you know, it's like R and mystery, like there are some benefits to that, but I think it's also saying be careful about using technologies that you don't fully understand because you will be sorry. And that happened in both of those those episodes, right? Yeah. They're just playing around and, and chaos ensued as a result right. of that. Yeah. How many, how many people picked up Joanne's book in the lobby tonight? Yay. Great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Yay. Uh, because one of the things I thought was really interesting about that is it, it is looking at the show from a cultural perspective mm -hmm. and the impact. You were just talking about the mistrust of science mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Could you say more, a little bit more about that point of view? Well, I think that, I mean, I think Stefano even, even said, I mean, it, well, first of all, um, this is when a little bit after, a few years after um, Eisenhower talked about the, the power of the uh, military industrial complex. So in a lot of episodes, you, they're criticizing either the military or um, government or, or scientists. Mm. And I know Stefano said at one point, you know, these are the people who thought it was a good idea to drop a nuclear bomb. <laughs> well, also, also one, so, thing that, yeah, well, one thing I love about Outer Limits and also about Twilight Zone and Star Trek as well, that's the triumvirate of shows that made me want to be a writer in the first place uh, was the compassion. There's a humanistic element. Mm -hmm. And the fact in both of those episodes, the alien is not the villain. And that's remarkable when you think about it coming off of an entire decade of, of monster movies from the 50s where, where the alien was, the other was the thing to be afraid of and to be suspicious they of. We want our light bulbs, our women, our yeah. water. Our yeah. Well, we, we kept the trope of <laughs> yeah, screaming women, yes. but at the same, at the same time. It was 1963. Yeah. I know. But, but at, the, at the same time, in The Outer Limits, humans are more often than not the monster to be right, feared. And and I think theme, right. and I think in terms of technology, you know, television is really taken over in American homes for the first time in the early '60s, and Outer Limits taps into this idea that there's this object in your house now that's delivering beams. So I, I wonder if any of you want to expand on that idea, where the control voice is actually taking over your TV. Well, I know I know that when it first happened on first broadcast, the, Joe Stefano told me a story about how uh, people wrote angry letters to uh, the TV <laughs> show saying, my TV hasn't worked correctly since this episode. 
That's great. And you guys yeah. owe me for the repairs. Yeah, yeah. But there was, but the, but there was great intimacy to television. The fact that it came into everyone's home and it was a common mythology. Everyone, because there were only three networks, everyone knew everything that was on and all of the actors. It was like a, an ensemble group of actors who you would see Sally Kellerman in this, then you'd see her on Star Trek or, or Martin Landau, you know, in Mission Impossible and so forth. There was a great, I mean, it was, you know, everyone knew who these people were and they would, be on, they would pop up on every single show. So, um, so it, it wasn't like movies where you had to go out and pay money to see something. There wasn't, you didn't have to deliberate, you just had to turn it on and there it was. And it was presented as this this benign technology, right? Mm -hmm. That pe it was a piece of furniture that people had in their in their living rooms, um, and that was what was so cool about the opening credits. It was almost like a, a Brechtian alienation technique, right? That makes people aware of the unsettling aspects of this technology. That that it's new at the time. Like people didn't really understand it. And with that, David, tell us why the show could not be called Please Stand By. Oh, I, I, well, I wanted to say, first of all, to what Joanne said, bear in mind that these shows, this like the, the, uh, the Galaxy Being, is an episode where the alien is asking questions of the audience like, is there a god? <laughs> or, 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 sing, it's a TV show where yeah. clearly... What's going on? Uh-oh, look out. Well, I guess that's God answering, yeah. It's, it's, you bet. It's the tunnel of light. Yes, exactly. We're not in control uh, of exactly. the technology. It's like, yeah, we've lost control of the theater. That's funny. Okay. Uh, it's a TV show where the characters ask, is there a God? Do you have death in a world yeah. where the standard was the Beverly Hillbillies and the Cement Pond? I mean, come yeah. on. Right, yeah. There's all these seven-year-old kids watching, right? Yeah, well, I was one of... Yeah, I was, yeah, yeah. Really? Right. Yeah. But to your question about the title, um, remember, this was the age of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, the network turned around and said, what's the title of your show again? Please stand by. We can't put that on a TV screen. Right. And so for a while, even more, even more weird, even more weirdlier-y, uh, the show was briefly called Beyond Control, <laughs> which kind of gave you an idea where the network heads were yes. at. And then uh, I don't know where the term The Outer Limits first came up. I first saw it in The Right Stuff, the book of The Right Stuff, mm, yeah. where the jet pilots talked about pushing the outer limits of the envelope. Maybe that's where they copped it from, but yeah. please stand by. It just wouldn't play as there, a title. There, there, was, there was a radio show, X-1, that had an episode called The Outer, the outer, Lim the, yeah. the outer Limit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the Twilight Zone title actually came from the, the Air Force as well. Uh, yeah, again, aeronautical terms, because Rod was, had been a paratrooper, and he was always into airplanes, yeah. And his brother was the aviation editor of, a, the editor of a, a Aviation Weekly. So, But, but again, these, these shows are really... As you said, Dave, uh, when you compare them, things that were like Gilligan's Island, Beverly Hillbillies, the standard shows, you know, the Lucy show, I mean, these are really mind-bending shows. I mean, you know, it's a, from Twilight Zone to this, there's a, there's a different voice to these two shows, but a lot of really um, out there stuff. It's a lot for an eight-year-old to absorb. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I know, it was on at 7.30 on Monday nights. Yeah, you, you had the choice of a game show on the, on the network, on the opposite network, yeah. and right. then and a also movie. a movie. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, with a program like this, it does kind of run contrary to what advertisers want, right? Because <laughs> television is supposed to lull you into a sense of complacency, make you feel good about things so you go out and consume. Yeah. And this show some, somehow does something different. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine the kind of products you would you would properly advertise on the Outer Limits unless it was you know, anti-depression medications, <laughs> of well, yeah, funeral homes, home, home, yeah, home brain know, surgery, home brain surgery. Yeah, <laughs> oh, Joanne, when when were you first ex exposed to this show? I'm I'm your age. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. By the way. That's good. That's this good. is archaeology you're seeing here. <laughs> well, no, um, no, I mean, I, I, but to be fair, I, I watched it a little bit later. I used to watch it uh, with, with my, we, I grew up in Boston, I'd watch it with my, my brother, and it mm. would um, follow bowling, <laughs> mm. which was like, well, first it, it was Saturday, so first would wow. be cartoons, then bowling, and you'd be wow. like, lull to sleep, and then this would come on. From and then, bowling to the outer limits. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then yeah. creature feature after that, so. <laughs> well, talking about how TV was different, during this time. Um, Joanne, explain what, why we see a spoiler alert at the beginning of Bella Rose Shield. 
from what I understand, that was the network uh, insisting. I don't think that, that uh, uh, Stevens and Stefano wanted that to happen at all. And, no. and it's basically to keep you sitting there, right? It's, like, it's a teaser. It's a yeah, teaser. that's what it's called, uh, yeah. Essentially, most TV shows would open with a minute or two minutes of something really dramatic happening so that people would watch the show and wait through the minute of commercials yeah, or whatever. A yeah, ABC, yeah. Uh, the only way that they could stamp on the outer limits an idea idea it to their uh, you know table of suits was it's a monster show mm. and very quickly after they had four episodes done they the network went to Leslie Stevens and Joe Stefano and said well we want to see that monster at the beginning of the show mm. Mm. I mean, that's right. immediately right and in many wow. cases it blows plot twists in in the episode yeah. they didn't care as long as you could see that monstrous presence right in the beginning of the show before the titles yeah. It pleased them, and that's why we have those teasers. Mm. And, and speaking of the monsters, Stefano, in the Bible for this show, calls the monsters the bear. Yeah. So, yeah. Does, Mark, do you want to talk about the bear? No, let, let Dave talk about it. That's fine. Go well, for I it. I want to know what your definition of the bear is. I just think it's a perfect description of what those things were. But the fascinating thing was when someone who's not talked about very often is Fred Phillips, who's the makeup guy, and John Chambers also worked on the show, mm -hmm. and the fact that they were looking for different ways to do aliens where you'd cover the nose, you'd do things differently so that it, the actor's face was not as recognizable. There's a very characteristic really looking alien to this show, mm, and yes. most of those aliens were uh, sculpted by a guy named Wa Chang, yes. who, uh, Wa Ming Chang, who worked for Project Unlimited, which, who had just taken home an Academy Award for the Time Machine, mm in 1960. Most of them are Waz sculptures. Uh, the Belleroy Shield guy is a classic Wa Chang alien. The Galaxy Being was sculpted by Charles Schramm hmm. because they didn't have a team at yeah. the point that they did the pilot. And, they and shot he worked it on Twilight Zone also. Yes, he yeah. did. Yes, yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah. And, and Mark, you talked a little bit about the creature effects for that, but David, go into because you go into a lot of detail in your book about that effect. Des describe that Galaxy Being costume and how they did that effect. Not to blow it for you all, but the galaxy being costume, you may have noticed in certain shots of this, there's a weird flap on the back of his head. That's because um, William O. Douglas Jr., son of the Supreme Court Justice, who played the monster, is wearing a scuba suit backwards <laughs> with an air tank in it. I actually have a photo of Leslie Stevens, Joe Stefano, and 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 Douglas in the suit on a stage without the negative reversal mm. photographic effect. And he was dragging an oxygen tank behind him <laughs> on the set. And he said when they were giving him direction on the show, Leslie would say, move left, move right, pantomime. Douglas played it as though he was a praying mantis walking on a world that he perceived of being made of glass. Mm. All right? And Douglas would say, Leslie Stevens would give him directions, and Douglas, all Douglas could hear was, <laughs> <laughs> and then the headpiece um, uh, was a sculpture by Charles Schramm uh, that they straightened out, and they took, reportedly, they took the, uh, the, uh, the eyes out of a crow statue <laughs> and stuck them on the, uh, the mask, and they negative reverse out really neat, mm -hmm. I think. Mm. And isn't, isn't it true, David, that you can never, we never see the galaxy being uh, with another character? Yeah, right? when they you're looking at every single shot in this show, the, those two are not in the frame at the same time because the galaxy being is a superimposed optical effect. Mm. You can see it miss the borders mm. occasionally. It doesn't matter because they did it in a hurry and nobody had ever, also, nobody had ever done stuff like this on TV before. It was rare when even, not even Twilight Zone no. had done aliens like this. I mean, it's, it's avant-garde when the galaxy being walks into the camera and it's, mm -hmm. it's almost like molecules or atoms on the screen. Yes, yeah. the and screen. he doesn't spend his time doing monster stuff. No, mm -hmm. no. He looks through the binoculars. He's looking oh, at so cool. the artifacts of this cool. planet yeah. as yeah. opposed yeah, he's to- He's a tourist. Yeah. But also one thing, one thing to point out that often I think a modern audience misses is back then, First of all, you couldn't watch a show when you wanted to watch it. You watched it when it aired, and there was no way to record it. You could record it on audio tape. I recorded the original Star Trek on real to real audio tape when I was 10, just in case it never aired again. But so you watched it when it was on. You couldn't pause it. You couldn't stop it. You couldn't go back. So it went by very quickly when you were watching it. And the TV sets, of course, were smaller, 19 
inch screen was a big screen and uh and and most people had black and white sets and, and so Everyone. forth <laughs> yeah 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 and so i mean the nbc was the all color network and moving into the 60s and star trek of course was one of the first great color science fiction shows but uh but it was a very different experience of watching television from what it, what it is now we're very fortunate right now uh, for those of you that have gotten the the DVD or the Blu-ray sets mm. of any of these series, because yeah. these things were shot on 35 millimeter film, mm. you know, uh, uh, lit and photographed by guys like Conrad Hall. And so when we get around to remastering them for DVD, they look better now than they've ever looked in history, mm-hmm. because they didn't look that good on your 626 scanline no. TV in no. 1963. No, and the and the seams you see on the special effects. On a big screen like this, or on Blu-ray, you would not have see. seen on TV mm-hmm. uh, with the resolution TVs at that time. So, so it was be forgiving. It was it was more real then than it is re- now watching on Blu-ray. Yes. So an incredible experiment. The first season, Stefano and Leslie Stevens are somehow battle the network and are able to do incredible things like the episodes we saw tonight. Joanne, what happened? Well, I think they just kept pushing the envelope and ABC kept telling them, make it more mainstream, make it more mainstream. And I think they just didn't think it would happen, you know, but uh, they they didn't get canceled. What were they? Um, Leslie Stevens said a bleeder, like they, their ratings were like just enough to stay on, on the air. Um, but they moved it to from Monday nights at 7.30 to Saturday nights at 7.30 up against uh, Jackie Gleason, which was then the most popular popular show on television. Mm-hmm. And I guess F- and Flipper was the other one, and so that yeah. took the kids away. Um, so they knew then, they knew the writing was on the wall. Um, and uh, I think Stefano quit first, and then Leslie Stevens followed soon after. The, the mm-hmm. thing that kills me about that time switch and that cancellation is that for a very brief period of time, they said, let's move the outer limits to Wednesday nights. Mm-hmm at 7.30, and Stefano said, if they'd done that, I would have produced one more season of this show. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wish I could have that season. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, so, I think he knew what they were doing when they moved him to Saturday nights. And I think Leslie, he... Leslie, you may notice that in the show, Leslie only directed the shows that he wrote himself. He was mm-hmm. a complete auteur, right? Mm-hmm. And he only directed the shows that he wrote himself, and we would have... F- four more at least of those weird yeah. episodes and, and also i think one of the reasons why uh, the original outer limits is less known than twilight zone and star trek is because there are few fewer episodes and back then going into syndication if you only how many episodes are there total there are 49 right and those were the days when you needed three seasons worth right. of shows to make a syndication package yeah, start syndicators would by. pay for yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And but but the outer limits was in, strangely enough, it was not only a bleeder, it was not only underseen, yeah. but it was in syn- syndication continuously from the day it was canceled. Mm. Mm-hmm. So that may speak something for the quality of the show. At least yes. I hope it does. Yeah. It was a perennial in LA for decades. Oh, yeah. It was on KTTV. On yeah, constantly. <laughs> um, I just wanted to go back to a second to before the cancellation, but what happens at the end of season one? And talk about season two a little bit. Well, season one, uh, some of you may have been here for our lovely screening of the Forms of Things Unknown <laughs> back a few years ago. I yeah, that yeah, was probably like about, about a decade eight ago. Eight or nine years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, that show aired, and uh, the network went, what? <laughs> yeah, and know. we would have shown that tonight, except we did show that before, because that is one of the most incredible but pieces of TV know. ever made. It, it is. Your, your film education is incomplete if you have not seen the forms of things unknown. Mm. And, and, uh, but this pairing, you know, like wine pairings and stuff, yeah. this is a particularly good selection yeah. of two shows. And what happened uh, between the two seasons was Steven Stefano got muscled out. Mm. Mm. Uh, the network suits took over the show. They put in one. They put in a guy as producer named Ben Brady, whose most biggest credit, most biggest, <laughs> whose biggest credit was producing Perry Mason. There's nothing yeah. wrong with Ben Brady. He's a swell human being and everything, but he's a meat and potatoes television producer, yeah. who was one of the guys who actually approved the Outer Limits <laughs> for broadcast in the first place. Wow. And now. Instead of being a network suit, he's put in the same position Leslie and Joe are in, where the network's coming to him and says, 
You can't have that much money. Mm. You can't do. Where are the monsters? Mm. You can't. And with less money per show, and then they slash off a shooting day, and it's like the show just strangled on its own blood. Mm. It lives on forever in uh, reruns, and then now on Blu-ray. We've yeah. got we've got forty nine of them. Folks. Well, 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 also it's, it speaks to the fact that the creators of these shows, the people making these shows, had a different objective than the network had. And Rod certainly encountered that, and certainly the, you know, Leslie Stevens and Joe Stefano did, which is they're trying to be artistes. They're trying to ha- create uh, stories that are meaningful and powerful and fresh and truthful. The network is, they don't want to make waves. They want to make sausage, essentially. Yes. You know, and so the Beverly Hillbillies, the, you know, all these comedies they're churning out, those are safe shows. Even something like Perry Mason is a safe show because you've seen one and you've seen every Perry Mason, basically. You know, and uh, so to have something this renegade uh, you know, for the, to the network executives, it's like trying to hold on to a snake that's writhing. You know, and, uh, and so, they're, so that it was inevitable that the executives would be bumping heads with... Uh, but you know, but you, know, you know what's yeah. strange, though, is they must have known somehow what they were getting, right? Mm. Stefano had written the screenplay for Psycho. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, Stevens had done Private Property, which was talked about as you know the new the American New Wave. It couldn't get a distributor because it was so risque. So so it's hard to believe they didn't have any idea mm. what they were doing. In a sense. They had exactly an idea of what they were doing because Leslie is the guy who put Joe forth mm. as mm-hmm. the producer of the show. Mm-hmm. It's Leslie's show. He created it. He's right. producing it. But we need a producer, and they have a big meeting, and here's Leslie and Joe, and Leslie goes, Joe did Psycho. <laughs> ABC goes, ah. And they thought they understood the show mm-hmm. at that point. And, and also, let's just say, that ABC was struggling in... Dying and hoping for They're a hit. third of three. Yeah, yeah and yeah. to try to survive and try to reach a younger demographic, they would be willing to take a chance on that. Yes. But I, I can't imagine by the time the Bell Rose Shield uh, airs, you know, late later in the first season, mm. that they were happy with what they were getting. It's like getting um, a monster show where you're we're basically getting a Shakespeare play yeah. as a monster show. Yeah. yeah. And and you know the the, the suits have all got to be looking at each other at that point and going. Mm. Another one of these, Joe. Really? Yeah. I mean, the language is is very theatrical, uh, mm-hmm. even for you know television of that era. Remember what you were up against. You were up against Gunsmoke. Mm. You know, mm. you were up against predictable thing. And and I don't know how many of you have noticed this or not, but the way that this show is shot mm. is unique for its time period yeah. and very short lived. Mm. Because very quickly, in order to churn the sausage out faster, yeah, right. they learned to keep everything in the middle of the screen, light it as brightly as possible. Yeah. They wouldn't go for Dutch angles, you yeah. know. They wouldn't go for anything avant-garde. And TV assumed that uniform look. Well, yeah, that it I had mean, for the rest of the '60s. Well, also, also a, a great way, a great way of comparing is like compare a, a great episode of Twilight Zone with the Night Gallery, where everything is flat and looks like shit. <laughs> Even, I mean, the Night now, Night Gallery has many great episodes too, but it stylistically. It's night and day, literally. It looks like it was shot on the same set of two stages. Yeah. You know? yeah, and when, yeah, you, when you say Sausage Factory, that's what really shows on Night Gallery. It's, it's universal yeah, yeah, cranking out yeah, product. Yeah. And on the new Outer Limits. Remember that? Right. <laughs> yeah, which are pretty forgettable. Right. Anytime they try to bring back Outer Limits or Twilight Zone of these shows, they're, they're missing the key ingredient, which is, I think, yes. number one, the humanism that was in the original yes. episodes. Yes. And number two, the creators that had the heart to bring those originally to air, they're just not here. And, no. And the makers and of the revived Outer Limits series, which I wrote an episode for, yes. and I don't watch it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really bad. Mm. They took, uh, when Leslie Stevens died, uh, the producers of that new improved Outer Limits show took Leslie's name off the credits <laughs> four <laughs> weeks after he died, the guy who well, created yeah, the sure. show. Yeah, that's yeah, it's typical. That should tell yeah. you everything that you need to know. Yeah. Well, you know, also in order to write something meaningful, you have to have something you want to say. And in order to have characters who come alive, you have to know how to write characters. And in, in order to tell a story, you have to know how to structure a story. And in, in, in order to say something that hasn't been said before, to create something new, these are it's harder to make something great than to make something shit. You know, and so I think there's a reason for that. But 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 more than that, I think that. And now, now with Joe Stefano and um, and Leslie, were they in World War II? I don't know their their history specifically. 
Were they in the war? Leslie, wasn't Leslie in the Navy? Yes, he served. Air yeah. Force, yeah. yeah. Uh, Joe did not serve. He got right. an affirmative. of some but, kind. But the point is that Serling and Roddenberry and all these guys had gone through World War II. They had mm -hmm. actually experienced something. They had it in their lives. Yes, and I think that that, so their humanism came from a personal experience of life and death. And so I think that also made the work uh, more profound and I, deeper. I think that, and you know, the medium was still new and they were yeah. still seen with as having limitless potential as like uh, a medium for art. Yeah. It, it didn't really end up fulfilling. Before we call it a night, let's take a couple of questions from the time? audience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna take just a couple. And microphones yeah. are coming. Let's take one in the back, and then we'll take one a little closer Great. to the front. So, gentleman in the back with his hand way up there. Wait for the microphone. Hmm. Don't throw the mic. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know much about United Artists Television as we do about Desi Lu. Hmm. and Universal, but while Joe and Leslie were making these wonderful shows, who at United Artists was fighting for them against ABC, which did not quite understand what these two men were trying to do? And uh, did the regime at United Artists continue uh, for both seasons? No, they replaced uh, executives at United Artists the way you go through a bag of potato chips. But mm. they but they did have champions on the inside of the organization. One of them was a guy named Richard Dorso, who was the guy who approved the show for Network mm. originally. And another one was a guy who literally, almost literally single-handedly gave the green light to The Outer Limits, who was a producer who worked into the 80s, uh, named Dan Melnick. Mm. Yeah, and the name Robert Justman, we yes. know from Star Trek, yeah. the original series, uh, what do you know about Robert Justman's recollections and anecdotes about working with uh, Joe? Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a story about Robert Justman, and uh, Sunday Stevens can verify this because she works as an AD in film, and it's like interviewing all the people that worked on the television show. It's like go to the ADs, yeah. folks. <laughs> they know everything about what happened. And that was Bobby Justman, mm. that was Lee Katzen, and that was Claude Binion Jr., who were the top three 80s who worked on this show because they were there, like Bill Fraker behind the camera, they were there for every beat of every day of every show. And they were there to solve the problems for no money mm. at the last minute. Mm. You know, and well, well, if we cut out a piece of cardboard <laughs> and put it like, that'll work, you know, yeah. because they, you know, Got to, got to get it in the can. Yep. And Bobby Justman was not only one of the most delightful interviews yeah. I ever, I ever had time. for the, the period. You know him from Star Trek, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And, 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 but uh, funny, funny as hell. And I'll tell you something. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're a Star Trek fan or not. You don't have to be because I'm not really one. But he co-wrote a book with Herb Solo about making Star Trek. It's called... Yeah, the, the behind the scenes story or right, something yeah. like that, and it's a wonderful Star Trek book because it's the third of it is about the outer limits. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Let's take one more from the other. Oh, we got somebody way in the back. Let's, is, yeah. Okay, this will be our last question, so make it a good one. Hello. Hi, Marilyn. I'd like to say hello to everyone. My name is Marilyn Stefano. Yay! And Joe was my husband. And Dominic is our son. And I want to thank you so much for being such good fans of The Outer Limits. It's been a great experience, and it's wonderful to know that people still love it mm. and learn from it. And Joe would be very proud. I didn't see you back there. Oh. And it's, it's an honor to once again um, show his work on the big screen here. Uh, and we'll be showing it for decades to come. Thank you, everyone, yeah. for being here. And thank you, Marilyn, and for the Stevens family for being here. Uh, it means a lot to have you with us to honor 60 years of an incredible TV show. And yeah. unlike a lot of shows that are on now, we'll still be talking about Outer Limits in 60 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You bet. We'll be back. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys.